Hi, I'm Jay Heinrichs. I'm the Time Barry guy. The guy's trying to run his age up Mount Musilock in New Hampshire in fewer minutes than I'm old in years. I have once again Lee Michaelides, the official Time Barrier researcher, and today we're going to talk about the runner's high, which um, some people don't think exists, and most runners do think it exists. So, Lee, first of all, does the runner's high exist, and how often can you get it? It's pretty much established it exists, but it apparently is rare. I mean, the majority of runners don't get it and or feel it, and, and your, your friend, um, Amby Burfoot, calculated that he had one high after uh, 21,600 workouts. Okay, so, so Amby was the guy, American, who won the 1968 Boston Marathon and became editor of Runner's World. I worked for Rodale overseeing sports magazines there, and among them was Runner's World. Uh, and I've been running uh, a number of times with Amby, who um, is a marathoner, obviously, and so uh, he sustains terrific effort over a long time, but uh, does not run intensively. And one of the things, now, by the way, I should say, for details of the science, you wrote this terrific blog post, which is on uh, breakingthetimebarrier.com, um, and uh, where you can find all the details here. But basically, what, um, what, one of the things you wrote is that intensity seems to make a difference, right? It's, this te you tend to get high after a particularly intense run, correct? Correct. And then there's even some science in there where or some athletes are saying that all-out intensity may not produce it. But when you're in that spot they call the zone, which we've talked about, um, and maybe we should do more research, you're more apt to get the runner's high. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so now the runner's high is everybody knows is caused by endorphins, right? Everybody used to know that. Um, new science has basically just proved that. Um, back in the 70s when, when running became popular and they started doing a lot of research on this runner's high, they chalked it up to endorphins because they know that endorphins um, cause a decrease in pain. What they've learned since is that the uh, beta endorphin molecule that, that that we're studying is too big to get into your brain. There's something called the uh, a, a cellular barrier between your blood and your brain. So since then, they've come up with two theories of what may cause a runner's high. Um, one of the substances is called an endogenous opiate, and those are opiates that your brain produces. So they're inside your head already, and they don't have to cross in from your bloodstream. Um, and so that's one theory, but they don't know which one of these will cause a runner's high, if any of them, because they just don't have the, the tools to, to study that yet. Um, the other thing that they're looking at, and this is kind of interesting, it's called an endocannabinoid, cannabis, excuse me, and that sounds a lot like cannabis, because what they're studying is the active ingredient in cannabis that makes you high. And this apparently is a very small molecule that can travel all through the body, and they've done studies on uh, mammals, particularly dogs and humans, and they find that when dogs and humans exercise and run intensely, um, they produce this stuff. And there's even an evolutionary component because running is, you know, on a, on a kind of natural history sort of thing is kind of ridiculous. You expend a lot of energy and uh, you, you could injure yourself. But, you know, for millions of years or so, uh, Dogs and humans keep on running, so they think that there's an evolutionary connection to this. Okay, well, so now there, I have read about cannabis receptors in the brain, which are these pleasure receptors. So basically the two theories come down to whether when we run our bodies produce opium or, uh, or pot. I'll take either one as long as it's natural and perfectly legal. I can tell you, though, that I have... Um, um, gotten runner's high cons fairly consistently, maybe one out of every three uh, mountain runs, back when I was in my 30s and even into my 40s. After I turned 50, those highs pretty much went away, and you and I in an offline conversation seem to um, find out that um, there's no evidence that this stuff goes away when you get older. Maybe I should still be getting that high, huh? Possibly. I mean, they've done studies, but again, these studies are done on very small groups of people. You know, maybe 20 people here, 20 people there. And one of the studies I found compared guys in their early 20s with guys in their 80s. And they didn't seem to find um, 
any difference in their production of uh, endorphins. However, in some of these other studies uh, or these other substances, um, the research is really just starting out. So um, probably people don't know at this point whether you're going to be having fewer endocannabinoids or um, endogenous opiates as you grow older because it's a new field of science. Okay, well we'll leave it at that then. Um, in the meantime, people can go to breakingthetimebarrier.com and find more on your uh, science, including your um, blog post, which inappropriately contains a great photo of a guy enjoying a spliff. Um, but of course, we're talking about the kind of uh, pot that goes on inside your head, possibly. And uh, we can't wait to see what the further science will show. In the meantime, we're going to uh, continue sharing the science until I finally run my age next month, August 27th. In the meantime, stay cool, Lee. It's hot out there. It is. See you, Jay. All right. So long.